Greetings and welcome to another edition of CAS Talks. I'm Rafael Brun, professor at UFRGS Brazil and vice president of the IEEE CAS Rio Grande do Sul chapter. So, uh, without further ado, uh, let me welcome Professor uh, Fernanda Kastensmith, Head of the Applied CS Department at UFRGS, who will chair uh, today's session. So, welcome, Fernanda. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much, Rafael Brum. It's a pleasure to be here. And today I'm here to introduce uh, my colleague, Professor José Rodrigo Azambuja. There we are going to have the pleasure to see his talk. Uh, the title is in network computing and switch virtualization walk into a bar. Very interesting. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah, so uh, Jose Rodrigo Azambuja holds a bachelor degree in computer engineer from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, a master degree in computer science, also from the same university, and a PhD in computer science from URGS, and electrical engineer in KIT, like a co tutela uh, double diploma. He is currently as a, um, an associate professor at UNCS, chair in the IEEE CAS, Rio Grande do Sul chapter, president of Porto Alegre's Council for Science, Technology and Innovation, and IEEE senior member. José Rodrigo has authored over 50 publications uh, in, in journals and conference, and the book Hybrid Fault Tolerance Techniques to Detect Transient Faults in Embedded Processors. He has experience in the area of computer science with emphasis on synthesis architecture, working mainly on the following topics, network accelerators, embedded systems, and fault tolerance. We are very happy to watch your talk today. Thank you very much. So thank you, Fernanda. Thank you, Rafael, for, the, for, for opening the session. Um, I did not mention here, but Fernanda was my advisor, so it's a pleasure to have her introducing my talk here at, at CAS Talks. Um, and so, uh, as you can see, my talk starts with a joke, like in network computing and switch virtualization, walk into a bar. So what happens next, right? So um, uh, I, I've been working on uh, the, uh, the IEEE CAS Talks for a long time right now. I, I believe I gave a few talks uh, in person a few years ago. And Rafael and I, and also Ricardo, we've been managing the, these cast talks for the past two years. So um, I'm actually really glad to be here um, giving this talk, finally, uh, in this virtual environment. Um, and so let's go to the talk then. Let me just switch here very quickly. OK. So um, in network computing and switch virtualization, walk into a bar. So this is one of the, those cases where um, I'm not sure if you know those YouTubers and streamers which try to blend stuff. Like they have a blender and they throw an iPhone inside and turn on the blender and check it. Well, will it blend or not? So this talk is kind of uh, on the same idea. So we have two major concepts here, which are in-net or computing, and a second, uh, which is switch virtualization. So what happens when we mix these two together? So um, this is actually an open question uh, on the research topic. So we actually don't know what we can do with these two things. So the idea of this talk um, is to introdu introduce you with some background on networking, on the main concepts um, which must be taken into account to understand in-network computing and virtualization, switch virtualization. Um, so as we are talking about circuits and systems, um, this is actually a, a very interesting area, uh, but still um, most of our talks are more related to microelectronics. So I'm having a, a, a nice background on networking. So if you don't know anything about ne computer networks and so on, don't worry, I have a nice background. here. So um, for the outline of this presentation, a, I have a background on networking. So I'm going to explain briefly what computer networking was back in the day. And the day would be around, around the 60s, so around 60 years ago. Um, then I'm going over programmable virtual switches, or PVS. PVS is our proposed platform for doing lots of stuff. Um, and then uh, through the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you some, some applications. 
on how to use in-network computing, uh, actually with switch virtualization for artificial intelligence and also for CDN, which stands for Content Delivery Network. So we are talking about how Netflix delivers content over networks or how you can see a soccer match or how you can play on xCloud or on Stadia. So all, all these applications are inside CDN. Um, and finally, I'm going to end this presentation with some collaboration opportunities on what we have to offer um, in, in part of this collaboration and what can a student look forward uh, to working with us. So first of all, our team, um, I have a large team. I believe most of them are here in the audience and they are watching the, the video right now. So I have Weverton and Luciano. They are both professors at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. So they are my colleagues. <clears throat> and they are mostly from the networking side. And then we have Mateo Sacchetti. Mateo Sacchetti is the principal investigator of most of this talk. So Mateus is our harder guy. So Mateus is the guy who, who programmed and described most of, most of the harder lines that we are going to see here. And then we have Guilherme. Guilherme finished his master's um, a few months ago. And Guilherme is more on the, on the programming side. And then we have some undergrad students. We have Pablo, Ivan, and Leonardo. So Pablo, um, is currently working on an internship at an FPGA company here in Porto Alegre, Rio Grande do Sul. And Ivo is finishing his um, computer sciences course. And Leonardo is close to finishing his engineering degree in computer, in, um, computer engineering. So um, let's move on to the background on networking. So starting our talk. Uh, by the way, this talk is supposed to be around 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes, something like that. So I hope I won't bother you guys. So um, starting on this background, <clears throat> networking um, started back in the 60s. So packet switching uh, started back in the 60s. And then in the 70s, we had the birth of TCP IP. So I am sure most of you know what TCP IP is, is a, a protocol for addressing computers in the in the web and making connections um, and then we had the internet so the internet changed a lot from the 60s and 70s to what we have today um, in the 80s and 90s we actually delivered the world wide web which stands for the triple w so www dot something from your website um, and in those days changing the whole World Wide Web was kind of an easy thing because you only had a couple computers and a couple connections and a couple links. So if you wanted to change all the routers of the internet, you would change about, I don't know, I'm guessing a hundred, a thousand routers and you have a new internet, right? So um, only a couple hundred devices and there you go, you have a new internet. So today, um we have something else uh, i mean most of you guys have seen some not so nice cables some on the backbone of internet um some of you might have heard the noise that these guys make and basically we have a completely interconnected society uh, technologies we have cloud providers we have let's say uh, cell phones we have iot so currently, um, the state of the network, the computer networks that we have is something completely out of our control. So can you just imagine how many routers we would have to replace just to add a new protocol? Let's say uh, IP, the IP protocol. We are currently mostly using IPv4 and IPv6 um, has been, um, they are, they are actually trying to deploy IPv6 for, I would say, at least a decade. And I am sure that some of you guys have routers that do not support IPv6. So updating the network, modifying the network, uh, it's something completely uh, out of our league. So basically, um, we cannot. it's really hard to upgrade stuff on the internet. 
and one could say it's virtually impossible to completely upgrade the internet. Um, and this is what the, ne the network people call networking ossification. So you cannot change stuff. You have, it's really, really hard to upgrade stuff. And you have um, a very challenging area to improve networking, okay? So let's say, let's take AT&T or in Brazil, let's take uh, Claro, Net, for example, or your provider, um, convincing them to change part of their network infrastructure is almost impossible because you don't want to change something that is working already. And if something goes wrong, well, internet falls down. And I know, <laughs> I know that you will probably be very pissed if, you, if your internet goes down. So uh, it's a hard thing to do. And it has been for um, since the beginning of the internet, since the beginning of networking in the 60s. But there is some um, hope. Uh, for example, uh, this scenario has been changing recently. But I mean recently, I mean like in the past decade, not much more than that, with three new concepts. So uh, I'm going to go over these three concepts, and this is basically the background on networking, okay? But these are some very specific concepts. So the first one is called net, uh, Software Defined Networking, or SDN. The second one is Network Virtualization, and the third one is Domain Specific Language. And the fun fact is that Domain Specific Languages is not a new thing. It's actually a very old thing. The new thing is domain-specific languages apply to the networking domain. So anyway, um, let's start with the, with the first one, software-defined networking, or SDN. <clears throat> so what's the idea behind software-defined networking? Um, the idea here is if you imagine a router, a router does have a firmware, so it has a huge um, network stack or protocol stack. And then this whole firmware works on top of a hardware. And the hardware is usually a chip, uh, an ASIC chip, that basically forwards packets. So the idea here is to decouple these two things. So if you check um, digital circuit design, you usually have the control, the control path and the data path. Let's imagine a microprocessor here. You have the data path where you're basically moving data from registers to memory, from registers to register, memory to memory, and so on, IOs to IO or something like that. You're basically moving data from point to point. This is basically the data path of a microprocessor. And then you have the control path. And the control path decides what happens. So should a branch uh, take place or in the control flow of an application or not, right? So where do we start uh, running this kernel or this kernel application? How do we call a function? So this is uh, on the control side. So previously on computer networking, we only had one thing. You have a router and that's it, okay? Like some sort of a um, single cycle microprocessor, something like that, some, something very old. So the idea behind software defined networking is decoupling the control plane from the forwarding plane. So the forwarding plane now receives packets in, in its inputs, decides, uh, I mean, process these packets and outputs these packets to be transmitted somewhere, right? So it's uh, very straightforward, some sort of a pipeline where data comes in and data comes out. So what happens to the data or the branches or the control flow of the data processing is on the control plane, right? So, I mean, this is kind of a node concept when we talk about microprocessors and systems of architectures, but it is quite a new concept for networking. So decoupling networking um, on the, from the control from the data or the forwarding plane. So in the end, um, what you have here is the intelligence on the control plane. And what I am going to show you um, soon about the match and action tables, right? So how these things work. So <clears throat> let me give you an example of how this works. Let's say we have a control plane and a forwarding plane. Here, I mean, it's the same figure as, as before. 
and these guys are running some um, a stack of protocols. So we have Ethernet, we have VLAN, so virtual local area networks, and we have the IP version four. And now, what you wanted to, what you actually want to do is you want to add a new protocol to the stack. So ten years ago, you would take your router, you I don't know, donate it somewhere or just throw it away and buy a new router that has MTAG. This is what you would do like 10 years ago. And imagine doing this for the whole internet, it's just unfeasible. So now what we do is we actually, we reprogram the control plane and the control plane tells the forwarding plane, well, now you actually know MTAG and now you're going to process MTAG. So what happens is we can just add the new protocol to the forwarding plane and this whole guy is updated and now it's working okay of course you do need some uh, hardware structures here to implement some so some protocols okay for example let's say floating point if for some reason your protocol requires floating point it would be at least smart to have some floating point units in your forwarding plane right but anyway you, you do have some some margin here to add and remove protocols so now um, we have a new router or a new uh, switch or something like this um, that runs MTAG. But now I want to update IPv4. So, um, but you can check here. I'm not actually replacing IPv4 with IPv6. I'm actually wanting to add my own protocol, which I'm calling here IPvX. It can be here seven, eight, nine, whatever. It, it doesn't have to be called IP. You can call it whatever you want. The idea here is that we want to replace a non um, protocol by a customized protocol that you have just invented. In, I mean, uh, you could remove some of some parts of the header. You can change how the headers work. Anyway, you can change whatever you want in this protocol and you want to update it. So uh, through SDN, this is feasible. Basically, what we do is we reprogram how the switches see and process these packets. So I'm telling, okay, forwarding plane, uh, from now on, instead of looking at these bytes of, let's say, a, a packet is, is an array of bytes, and I'm saying instead of looking from bytes 0 to 7, you're going to look fr from bytes 3 to, I don't know, 10, for example. And from... And with this information, you're going to decide to, let's say, drop this packet or forward somewhere, right? Or change some bytes and so on. So we can do that through SDN. Um, and by reprogramming how the switch is seen process the packets, we can remove IPv4 and add the new IPvX. And then simply like that, you have an updated router, okay? Um, and here we have a full picture a complete picture of how SDNs work. Uh, let me just go previously really fast. So as you can see here, we have the control plane and the forwarding plane. I'm actually making things simpler, okay? But in reality, what we have is something like this. So as you can see here, in the bottom part, uh, let me see if I can, yep, okay. So in the bottom part here, we have the data plane or the forwarding plane. And as you can see here, we have some network elements. So we, we can have multiple network elements. And then um, in this part here, we have the control plane. And finally, which I had not shown you before, we have the app plane here. So, sorry for my mouse here. Anyway, so what happens is um, the, the, the tenant or the, or you, for example, you have an, an application and uh, an SDN application. And basically what you do, you go to an interface and a control interface, and these interfaces connects to the forwarding element and it reprograms or changes the network element and so on. And of course, throughout this whole thing, you have a management and an admin communication here. So um, this looks nice. I mean, it's not a nice picture, but anyway, uh, the idea here is nice, and you. But, but there are some some challenges here, especially in terms of security, in terms of access, in terms of knowing which network elements you have. Instead, uh, in terms of 
knowing what kind of control you can do over your network elements and so on. But anyway, this is an overview of SDN and what it provides, right? So moving on, we have network virtualization. So I have a second example here of um, network virtualization. Um, and as you can see here, from the bottom, from the bottom up, right? What we have here in the bottom is an infrastructure provider. So what you have here is cables and the backbone. Okay, you have routers and switches, and you have actually physically your interconnected network. So you have some submarine cables going from South America to North America, from South America to Europe, and so on. This is actually those links, these physical links here. And you have some guys that, that are actually uh, forwarding these packets. But as you can see, um, having the physical layer and actually having the logical layer are two different things. Because uh, usually you have a company or a country or an organization that has the physical layers and you rent this structure to ISPs. So this would be some internet service providers. So chat. I do believe that AT&T, for example, has both of them, okay, but that's not always the case. And then you have a virtual network, so you can make your own interconnections virtually on top of this physical layer, right? And then you can have a virtual um, child network on top of your parent virtual network. I mean, this is missing you here, virtual network. And so on. So this is the idea of virtualization. You add abstraction layers to your physical infrastructure so that you can easy, more easily deal with your network. So um, just to make sure here, we have a on the bottom part a physical router. So this guy may host one or more virtual routers. So this is one for N relationship. So we have one physical router which can uh, deal with multiple virtual routers, and this is usually built upon ASIC chips, on network processors, and on FPGAs, but mostly on ASIC chips um, because we need very, very low latencies. So we are talking about nanosecond latencies here. So th th these guys really need to, to act really fast and forward packets really fast. Um, not only that, but it, you also need some throughput. So it's not only the, the um, how fast the packet travels on the network, but how many packets you can travel at the same time throughout the network. And then we have here a physical link. So as you can see here, we have actually some cables, some fibers, and so on. And this can be implemented with any sort of technology. So. Going back to our picture, when we talk, uh, when we look at the the virtual side here, the virtual side, we have a virtual link, which is a logically isolated from virtual link. So you have to logically isolate the physical channel. So you have some uh, access um, credentials here to actually use the physical layer. So we have a whole abstraction layer on top of the physical layer. And finally, we have some virtual routers. So it, a, a virtual router can actually be run on top of a, a GPP, a general purpose processor. It's not going to be fast. It's going to be really, really, really slow um, because you have to run code, deal with IOs. This, is, this can be really complicated. It can run on top of a FPGA, for example, or on top of a, a router, an ASIC router. And of course, these guys has to have to be isolated from other virtual routers. Okay, they are interconnected, but still they are isolated. Each each virtual router um, has its own resources, but these physical resources might be shared with other virtual routers. Okay, um, we can look at a virtual router as a virtual machine, like a VM. Okay, so you have your own random access memory, your own RAM memory, and your own space, uh, disk space, but the physical disk is being shared with other VMs and the same for the for the RAM memory. So basically, this is what we have on network virtualization. This is also something new. And then um, for the third background part of our talk, 
um, we have domain specific languages. So uh, DSL, as I said before, domain specific languages are not something new. They are actually quite old. Um, but when applied to the networking domain, they, they become something new. So uh, the idea here is, uh, is that a, a DSL is a computer language specialized to a particular application domain. So you can have uh, DSLs for analog systems, for digital systems. Uh, we have plenty of them for networking, for, let's say, uh, CUDA, for example, on the GPU side is kind of a, a specialized language, right? Because we are dealing with massive amounts of data and among lots and lots of other uh, options. But the interesting thing here about the networking domain is that the first language to deal with the networking domain is from 2015. So it's a six year old language. If you think about the C language, the C language dates back to the 70s. So we have C language for 50 years. That's almost 10 times more than we have a networking domain languages such as P4. And I mean, C is not even the first language. You have a few other languages previous to, to C. And I, I'm not sure, but I, I would say they, they date back to the 50s and the 60s. So, um, and the first appearance for a domain specific language for networking domain is on 2015. So this is actually amazing. As you can see, um, this is why we have a so ossified network because the, te the technology that, that is going to change that is being developed in the past decade. That, that is really crazy. Um, the first language, as far as I know, that started competing with P4 is POF, which stands for Protocol Oblivious Forwarding from 2017. So that's four years ago. And still last year, we had a new language, which is one of the first languages that takes into account the hardware substrate, which is called Lyra. So Lyra is one year old, I would say one year in a couple months old. So as you can see, um, this is quite a new research area. Um, well, anyway, from these languages, I am going to focus on the P4 language, okay? Because this is the most known, uh, most open source, uh, it has a huge community and so on. So when we talk about P4 again, this dates back to 2015, so that's six years, six years ago. Um, it is maintained by the P4 language consortium and this consortium is backed up by the Open Networking Foundation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it is open source and it is permissively licensed code. So anyone can use P4. Uh, P4 it's currently in its version 16. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is because of the year of P4, um, version 16. Um, and yeah, so. Uh, I am not actually going to give you examples on the P4 language because I think this would be wasting your time. You can just go and download some examples online. But I'm going to 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 discuss briefly how P4 works. Okay. So the idea of P4 is to act on top of this switch architecture, which is called PISA, so Protocol Independent Switch Architecture. So as you can see here, protocols come this, uh, sorry, packets come this way. So you have here a network packet and it goes out this way, right? right? So as you can see here, we have some sort of a pipeline and on each stage, something happens to the packet. So we have on the input, a parser. So the parser tries to parse what's happening on the, on the, on the packet. So it kind of opens the packet and parses some of the headers and some, Anyway, you can actually program that, right? So it basically opens the packet and checks stuff, right? And then you have some um, these stages here, which are actually called match and action stages. So here we have three. You can have multiple of these guys, like 10, 16, whatever. And then you have a deparser. So what happens here, you repackage your packet, your network packet, and you send it away. Okay, 
So the main, main idea here is we open something, a string of bytes, we open it, we decipher what's happening on it, so we parse its data, and then we process its data throughout the pipeline, so here, and then we put it back together and we send it away, okay? So this is basically what uh, the PISA uh, switch architecture uh, says one should do. And this is what actually P4 does. So P4 describes the parser, the deparser, and what happens in the middle, okay? So if we look at the middle, okay? So um, let's check this guy here. So what we have here is a very regular structure. So we have memories and ALUs. So arithmetic logic units and memory, okay? Um, currently, P4 uh, does not support floating points. So we are talking about integers here. So what we have here is bunch of memory and ALU. And I'm sure Fernanda, the chair, who can see some resemblance with an FPGA here. So I look up table. Um, and this is basically what happens here. The memory kind of acts like a lookup table and the ALU performs some sort of, of um, data processing. So um, this memory plus ALU, they are something like a match and action table. So you receive a data, you check it against the memory, and then you decide to do something. That is pretty much the same thing as a lookup table on an FPGA design. Then, of course, you have some um, integers processing here in the middle, and basically you describe how that works, okay? So this is basically P4 and a small spice of PISA here. So um, to finish our background, I'm, I swear to you guys, I'm almost finishing the background. Uh, we can talk about some current uh, products that work on top of this whole thing. So as you can see here, we have Intel Tofino, and you might see some issues here because we have Intel Tofino and then we have Barefoot Tofino here. So the thing is, Intel bought Barefoot and of course bought it because of Tofino. So what Tofino does is, um, you can see here one of those hack units, network hack units, so like a 1U or something like that. And as you can see here, we have a Tofino ASIC and an Intel CPU. And then you have IO ports here, right? So packets are coming here and they are leaving also from this side. Uh, packets come in to the, to the ASIC and the CPU is controlling this ASIC. So the ASIC returns stuff. So basically what we have here is a forwarding engine, which is this barefoot Tofino ASIC and the control engine is on top of the CPU. And as you can see here, the idea of Tofino is the same as PISA. You have a parser, and then you have, uh, it's not shown here, but you have a deep parser here on the outside. And then you have packets coming in, packets coming out. You have some buffering, um, and you have some retransmission here. So you can actually output a packet back into the pipeline. So let's say if you want to process the same packet in the pipeline a few times, you can actually do that. And on the control plane, we have the, the Intel CPU here. Um, Tofino is currently in its second version. Okay, it actually can achieve a few terabit of data. So it's actually a, a, a nice thing. It's a, a nice technology, a nice product. It's just not very easy to buy one of these because these are still in development. And on the FPGA side, um, we have Zarlink SDNet plus the NetFPJ project. So for the NetFPJ project, um, a few um, universities and companies uh, formed an organization to maintain this NetFPJ project. So the idea of the NetFPJ is to run P4 code um, on an FPJ. Okay. So this is the basic architecture. Um, these are some input ports. So data comes this way, and then you have basically a multiplexer here. Multiplexes all the data coming in, and then you have this guy. So this guy is actually your switch. I'm sorry for my bad mouth handwriting. You have your switch. Uh, this guy can be a custom switch. So whatever you program in P4 
theoretically you can deploy in this guy and then you have packets going out okay and then you have the control here that this control is being done by a microblaze because you're talking about starlings and it has some axi interconnects and so on and so on so um the idea here is we have a p4 code and then we send this p4 code through the zarlings sdnet okay and the idea behind sdnet is a high level synthesis tool apply to p4 so instead of inputting c code and uh synthesizing it to hdl you're actually inputting p4 code and synthesizing it to what we call simple sumi switch sumi is the name of the net fpga so net fpga sumi um and then you take this bit stream and you input inside this architecture and as you can see here we have a parser a deep parser and match and action pipeline so the idea behind pisa is still the same here okay so this is another product um again i'm not sure you can buy zarling sdnet i believe it's still in development we have some early access to it in its first version i believe it's in in its second version right now it's really hard to get access to it um so what's missing right uh by the way, I finished my background. So probably now you know everything you need to know about networking together the, our proposal. Um, uh, but also I showed you uh, Intel barefoot. It works really nice, uh, Zarlink SDNet. I mean, you probably won't be able to buy this stuff because they are still developing it. But the point is what's there to do, right? So what's missing? Uh, number one, network slicing is missing. Uh, network slicing and let me go back a few slides as you can see here we have a single switch we can put here going back to tofino we have a single switch that we can put here a single switch you cannot put two switches in the, on the same place okay actually to be fair tofino 2.0 has four of these chips so you can put one switch on each chip so but still not ideal um, so what's missing is we use the same uh, hardware resources to deploy multiple switches. So let's say two, three, four switches. And why? Because of multi-tenancy. So the idea here is like an Amazon Web Services. So instead of renting your server, you're actually renting your router. So you have a, a, a group of resources and you can have four or five clients deploying each client its own router on your hardware okay so for example let's talk google stadia um stadia is the gaming platform from google where you can play on the cloud and so on so the idea there is that google can do that because it has its own network infrastructure so it's network really fast you can send packets really fast so the idea here is the same okay so um you can rent your own network your own physical infrastructure even though it's a, even though if it's a virtual switch it's your switch okay so this is the idea behind network slice and, and multi-tenancy then we have profiling and debugging this is quite straightforward you want to profile or debug your protocol your deployment or wherever and finally switch migration so the idea behind switch migration is that you actually can have an app store for protocols so you sort of buy or you rent um, your own switch and then you can buy a bunch of protocols from an app store and if you want you can just switch or uh, sorry you can just migrate your switch from one point to the other one okay so it's kind of like you have in your own uh, vm and switching computer okay currently none of this is possible none of these are possible so this is uh, these are the main this is our main focus here. So um, programmable virtual switches or PVS. So we argue in favor of a virtualization model that can offer you um, the ability to preserve your IP. So your uh, stack of protocols is your own. You can make your own protocol and deploy it without having to share its source code. Source code. Um, 
still you need to have bare metal performance because you, we are still on the networking domain and you want to switch packets as fast as possible and you need to have control access security. So this is what we are tackling with programmable virtual switches. So this is the idea behind programmable virtual switches. Number one, you have two tenants, tenant one, tenant two. The one on the left is the blue tenant and the green tenant on the right. So the idea here, each tenant has its own applications and then you have to go through a control plane to access the data plane, okay? And so um, a couple of this, these figures are not completely correct because PVS is actually the whole system, okay? But we are focusing here on the forwarding engine of PVS. So what we have here is the same hardware, the same board, let's say the same FPGA board, with two different switches, one from each tenant, okay? And PVS can manage all of this. PVS can run the forwarding elements, PVS can deal with the control plane, and PVS provides access to different tenants. Um, on a general scale, again, uh, this is kind of what PVS looks like. So um, again, here is the forwarding plane. So if we can focus here, packets are coming in, packets are coming out. And here we have a whole implementation of a switch, which is based on the P4 language. And this uh, is tenant one virtual switch. We have tenant two virtual switch, and we have multiple other switches for multiple other tenants. Um, and of course, this brings out some real challenges here. For example, how to secure um, tenant access how to guarantee that one switch won't um, blow up the second switch, uh, how to maintain resources allocated for different switches, and so on. So we have a couple of challenges here that we that I'm going to show you how we, how we work on them. So uh, we have the control engine abstraction. This is the guy responsible for access control, and we have the forwarding engine slicing that is responsible for uh, distributing resources among different switches, virtual switches. So um, what I'm going to show you about programmable virtual switches or PVS is the forwarding engine slicing. Then I'm going over the control engine abstraction like very briefly, and then two sorts of implementations, FPGA implementation and ASIC implementation. So. Um, for the first one, forwarding engine slicing. So the idea here is to have multiple virtual switches in the same substract. We also want uh, AGLS support, so high level synthesis support so that you can, I mean, you can actually uh, write your own hardware and deploy it inside, um, inside PGS. But again, this is very counterproductive, right? You can just use high level synthesis and P4 and better describe your, your switch. And then we need to have full and partial FPGA reconfiguration because um, we need to add and remove switches. We have to, for example, let's say one tenant is off, uh, it, it, it actually rented for, let's say, an hour your switch. So at some point you have to remove his virtual switch and you have to add a second virtual switch. Or let's say you still have some space on the board and you want to add a, a third or a fourth virtual switch. So you need full and partial FPGA reconfiguration to do that. And finally, a public open source implementation. And let me tell you, um, our work is based on the canonical NetFPGA design reference, which is a, a picture that I showed previously on the SDNet plus NetFPGA. Uh, and this work is from 2019. So as you can see, two years ago only. So um, again, for the PVS, um, uh, we are going to initially focus on the forwarding plane. So it's this guy here. Um, so what we are going to do is we are going to expand it. Oh, thinking again, this is the same picture. I'm just going to zoom in here and show you what happens inside of the forwarding engine. So I'm not considering the, the CDPI agent or the control. We do have a control interface but I'm going to fo focus on the rest. So let me zoom in this picture. And this is what we have. So again, packets are coming in, packets are coming out, right? So um, 
the main difference is this VS array. So VS stands for virtual switch array. Okay. So the idea here, the, the main difference actually against the canonical design reference from SDNet plus Net FPGA is that instead of having a single switch, we have lots of switches. Okay. So as you can see here, we have tenant one, tenant two, and then we have some sort of a space. So uh, uh, we have some predefined resource area where someone can just come and deploy its uh, own virtual switch. So um, it's a, a very simple, straightforward modification, like it's a copy paste, right? You take a switch, copy it, and you paste it a few times. But the problem is um, with this, we have lots and lots of challenges. For example, let's say a packet comes into, uh, it, it is multiplexed into this IVSI. And the question is, what happens with this packet? I mean, previously we had only one switch, so you just forward it to, to the switch. But right now we have a few of them. Not only that, we have a few switches and we can have more or we can remove switches. So number one, we have to check if this is a valid packet, um, if we are going to send it to a valid virtual switch, if the virtual switch is actually deployed, or if we have to deploy the virtual switch previously to sending this packet, um, and a, 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 lot out of, a lot of other problems that we have to deal with. But anyway, we do this through the IVSI. So this guy multiplexes all inputs, checks it against its ingress table, and just sends it to the correct virtual switch. Virtual switch then does what virtual switch does do, and sends it to the output. So here we have some buffers, some output buffers we need. We still have to do some checkings, and finally we send the packet away. So this is the main idea of the forging engine. Um, the idea is pretty simple, but in, to implement this is uh, an, another thing. Also, we have a control interface. So this control interface deals with these ingress tables, with the egress tables, and also deals with each and every virtual switch. And then we have here some control access issues because you need to have your, uh, you, you have to guarantee that the right tenant is accessing its own switch. So we have lots and lots of small issues here that we have to deal with before actually deploying this guy. So um, on the next step, uh, we actually have to implement a virtual switch. So to do this, we also use the SDNet plus NetFPGA basic uh, design flow. And this guy is divided in three steps, the white step, blue step, and yellow step. So on the first step, what we have is a switch.p4. OK, so you have your description of your, your switch in p4. You have the descriptions of the registers you're going to use and of the tables you're going to use. So what we do here, we input these guys. So they are here. They go through Zarlink's P4 compiler and through Zarlink's SDNet compiler. And then we create a few files. So switch that uh, goes here, switch CLI goes here, and the switch HDL goes here. Okay. So on the second step, um, we have the wrapping of the switch HDL. So what happens here, switch HDL is generated through SDNet, and this is an encrypted HDL. So what we do is we take this encrypted HDL, we wrap it around a wrapper, which includes um, Axi buses, so Axi light, Axi stream. Uh, we add some information to this wrapper to know, well, this, the, this switch actually has an ID. And then we generate this final VS HDL. And this final VS HDL is the guy that you can deploy on your, on your FPGA. Um, and then for the third step, this is on the driver side. So what we have here, um, I don't have actually a picture, but, but what we actually need are the board drivers. We need the reconfiguration drivers and we need some memory maps. And finally, some um, drivers to access your switch. So this stands for CLI or a common line interface. So every switch in the board 
will have its own uh, command line interface, and we have to interface all of these things with the control engine abstraction. So um, on the control engine abstraction, I'm going to be very brief here. So um, let me just show you here an example. We have a flow starting on H1 uh, and going. So it's inputs here, outputs here, or here. Okay. So what we do here is uh, on the H1, as you can see, it starts uh, and remains stable. So H1 is okay. This is kind of connecting an oscilloscope to H1, H2, and H3. So H1 is sending packets, and H2 is receiving packets. And as you can see here, H3 is not receiving anything. Until a point where we conf reconfigure this guy, and suddenly um, H2 drops because the that uh, H1 flow is not going to H2 anymore. It is now going to H3. So this is just to show you that it actually works. Um, I have here, I'm going just going to go over this. I think my time is. So what we have here is a, a I'm showing here a poisoning attack from uh, an application, um, which is actually trying to destroy a second application. And this usually happens when uh, we have inside communication. So in the same board, the, the switches are communicating and one switch can actually break the other one. So this is mainly Ivan's work. Uh, it's his um, graduation project and he implemented a great system here to, that stops this. Um, now let's go for implementations. So FPGA implementation. So um, we are implementing this at the NetFPGA SUMI board. This is the most recent NetFPGA board. They're running at 200 megahertz. As you can see here, we have four optical interfaces connected uh, here. One, two, three, and four. So each of these is a 10 gigabit per second port. So we have up to 40 gigabit per second. And so we deployed PVS um, in this guy. We have a full reconfiguration option and a partial reconfiguration option. The problem with full, full reconfiguration is that we have to completely stop everything to do it. On the partial, we can uh, do um, online partial reconfiguration so the system keeps working. The problem is that with full reconfiguration, we have the whole board. So we can actually deploy, I would say, around eight virtual switches with full reconfiguration. And on partial reconfiguration, we have some issues deploying four. So you can see here, one instance, two instances. This is another VS, and this is another VS. So this is actually this was actually done by Pablo. So Pablo, I know you're there, so thank you. Um, and some resource usages. So I'm comparing here. Um, P4 NetFPJ. So this is for a single switch, and this is our option. So as you can see here, we use 11% of the board against 10% of the board. So it's a small increase in order to be able to, to allow multi-tenancy, virtual switch virtualization, and so on. So. And we have some application switches here. As you can see, they go from 6% board occupation up to 16. So usually, uh, our bottleneck is memory. If the switch uses too much memory, this is usually a problem for us. Um, so, so some experiments here, we have port saturation. So in red, you have here PVS, and then you have in green uh, NetFPGA, and the loopback is basically a, a cable, no switch, is a direct link. So as you can see here, it's kind of okay. Uh, and by the end, we have some TCP congestion here, and these results are kind of slightly awkward, but um, they all go back to, they, they all saturate at the same point, more specifically at 9.5 gigabit. So you have to pay attention that we are comparing to a single wire, and the single wire is at 9.5 gigabit. So uh, we are actually saturating at the same time. There, I mean, there is no degradation here. Um, then we are checking board saturation. So as I said, we have four um, 10 gigabit ports. So saturates at 40 gigabit. And as you can see here, PVS is in purple. And in green, we have the canonical reference. 
So for um, for um, an input of close to 40 gigabits, okay, uh, this is injected packets. So injecting lots of packets. Th this is um, we are going. We are um, this experiment uses a loopback packet. So the packet stays inside the router forever. So for 10 packets, we actually so we can measure latency and throughput in this exper in this experiment. So we are here at uh, not sure is exactly here. Um, and the P4 NetFPGA is slightly better than us, but I mean by a small margin here. In terms of latency, we have the green line and we have the red line. So latency is about uh, something like three nanoseconds. So the correct data is um, throughput drops by 6.5%. This is, I mean, this is not good. It, this is not bad. Um, and this is also our first version of PVS. Now, newer versions are have improved this, this data. And 1.8 nanosecond difference here from these guys. Uh, I believe this is on average. So, uh, and then simulated performance. So this is simulating packets. This is for net FPGA. We have some better data already. Again, for the first for the first uh, version, we have for the level two switch 120 gigabit maximum for PVS 20% below that. So this is a huge drop. 20% is just too much. But still. Um, here we have three virtual switches running in parallel on the same board, and we have 115 gigabit. So anyway, uh, there are some data to be improved, but still this is good results, uh, especially because PVS can handle multiple virtual switches, and NetFPGA has a single switch. Compare the, and also I have here a comparison, I guess, P4 visor. This is, um, let's say, an early implementation of P4 to, H, uh, to high level synthesis to HDL. And as you can see here, both NetFPGA and PVS are like 20, 20 times faster than this guy, 25 times faster than this guy. Anyway, um, so we have a proof of concept, active sport and board saturation, which is nine. We have bare metal performance, more or less 10%. Uh, simulation shows we could reach 100 gigabit, which is nice. We have full and partial reconfiguration. So it, we kind of achieved most of what we wanted to achieve. However, we are still far away from terabit capabilities. So terabit is far, far away from us still. So the this Vertex 7 board can only achieve around 100 gigabit. So we would need at least 10 of these boards to achieve terabit. So this is just unfeasible. Newer boards uh, can maybe achieve uh, 200 gigabit per second, 250, but still far away from terabit. A terabit would be a thousand gigabit, right? Um, so this comes for our next part, with it, which is ASIC implementation. So um, on the ASIC implementation, the idea here is to improve performance. So we want to reach the terabit per second and maintain programmability. So we still want to reprogram fully or partially um, switches. So <clears throat> we are aiming for a 65 nanometer technology running at one gigahertz. Uh, we had some criticism saying that we cannot reach 65 nanometers at one gigahertz. We actually can. Um, and for the FPGA fabric, we are considering in vertex uh, ultra scale, which is the 13P here. This is not the newest board, but is one of the largest boards. And for this work, I have to thank Sam Samuel from Tautec in Tallinn, Estonia. He actually uh, performed one of the first cast talks early in 2020. So you can go check in the channel how to build a tr tr um, trustworthy billion transistor chip. And he is our silicon guy. So he's the one who makes uh, usually the, the tape outs and so on for us. So this is what we have. Um, really quickly, we have uh, here FPGA logic. So this is supposed to be FPGA fabric. So you can still reprogram switches. And then we have all the buffering and the multiplexing, demultiplexing, buffering, so on, on ASIC. So this is from here to here. This is all ASIC logic, right? 
And then we have the actual physical layer. This is more analog stuff from here. Okay, so this is the, our idea is to fix uh, the architectural side and keep reprogrammability for the FPGA side, so for the virtual switches. Um, <clears throat> so what we had here is a, in terms of square millimeters, we had a total of 47 square millimeters for this guy. Number of cells, uh, 71,000. Dynamic power total, 28 watts. So guys, first of all, this is a lot. Okay, this is a lot of wattage. But uh, when we compare this dynamic power to Tofino, for example, Tofino is over 60. So it's still half of what Tofino does. And some results from the synthesis. So um, we achieve up to 132 gigabits um, for each switch here. And then what we have is 3,200 gigabit files. So 32 ports of 100 gigabits. Uh, we have 33 access streams. Uh, we can deploy from 11 to 26 virtual switches. <coughs> I'm sorry, one second. So on the FPGA fabric, that adds up to 3.45 terabit per second. And the board itself can achieve up to 3.2 terabit. So um, we can actually surpass 100 gigabit per second, and we can achieve 3.2 terabit per second with bare metal performance. So this is really, really, really interesting. However, <laughs> we still have stuff to do. Uh, what happens is we still have some space left on the board. So what we can do with this, because we use we use mainly um, memory. So on, F, on the FPGA side, we use lots of VRAMs and memory elements. But still, on the logic side, we still have some space left. So what can we do with this space left? So uh, the answer is um, offloading applications to run within the network devices. So we call it in-network computing. So Finally, we can close our title, which says what happens when in-network computing meets switch virtualization. So the answer is, uh, number one, distributed artificial neural networks and the CDNs. So, uh, so I'm moving to the end of my talk. This is going to be very brief. So idea number one, artificial neural networks assisted network infrastructure. So the idea here is that we have an artificial neural network and we can actually deploy its neurons inside the switches. And to do so, you can actually process data uh, going through the network. So you can actually collect data on one side of the network and have the answer to that process data in the end of the network. You don't have to actually offload data to a server process neural networks, and then return this data to the user. You can actually do everything inside the network. Um, so we actually have a prototype of this. So we have SmartNIC is a, a network interface card. So this guy can generate traffic and can process some stuff. So we deployed one neuron on a processor, a second neuro, neuron on a second processor, which is this SmartNIC. And we deploy two neurons on the on the FPGA, and so we are running here a one-to-one -one network. Not only that, we actually deployed a one-three-one network as well. Um, we can see here I do have some data. So um, this, our application here is mainly for in-band telemetry. So the idea is to check how. Um, What's the health of your connections and so on? And for that, you have to you, you need to get some data, and we have some lots of data here. So we have some throughput in packets per second for small packets, for large packets. Um, we have latency for different size sizes of packets. We have a comparison against the in-network telemetry, and finally the maximum distance um, for network available flows. So. Um, this project is actually called Skynet towards smart um, data planes, and this is a partnership between Brazil, Colombia, and Australia. We have lots of universities here. This is funded by uh, FAPESP, and we are currently working on this on this project. 
Um, and finally, for my last example, we have content delivery networks. So the idea here, for example, right now, uh, I am here, somewhere here, right? And we are making a connection to a server where I'm sending my face and my presentation to this original server. And this original server is sending to people in Europe, to, pe pe to people in North America, back to people in South America. And these local servers are sending you this video stream. So this is how things work here. Um, so what happens when one of you actually have an unstable connection to the edge server? So uh, first of all, we are talking about live streaming. So you do not have time to go back, right? We are talking about live streaming. We are talking about Microsoft xCloud. We are talking about Google Stadia. We are talking about someone watching the Olympics uh, or, or whatever. You just cannot go back and rewatch it. So what happens when your network drops a little bit? So this is, uh, this is the main idea, uh, is to use in-network computing to improve these protocol connections for CDN. So this is actually a partnership between, at least right now, between uh, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul and the Federal University of Pelotas. So um, to finish my presentation, uh, I have some collaboration opportunities for researchers. So what we offer, we offer complete HLS tools. So we can you, you can just give us your P4 and we can turn it into HDL. We have support for programmable virtual switches. We have a couple uh, net, uh, FPGA boards. We have plenty of smart NICs for generating traffic. And we also have technical support to our students. So if you do have uh, an application that you want to somehow compute data while data is trafficking through the network, you can just call us and we can prototype it in a week. Maybe. That depends on Saketch's time, on Mateo Saketch. If Saketch has time, then it's a week. If he doesn't, maybe a month. And finally, some collaboration opportunities for students. So we are always looking for undergrad, uh, oh, sorry, I am missing the R here, for undergrad scholarships. So it's to, uh, mainly students from computer and engineering courses, but we are open to anyone. And we also have um, consistent masters and PhD positions. So we have options through PG Micro and through PPGC. So you can either work on the hardware side, on the software side, on the security side. Uh, and here are our open calls for PG Micro and also for PPGC. So if you're interested, please let me know. And finally, some pictures. This is uh some of the guys so this is of course me this is professor weberton this is mateus and this is guilherme here as you can see it's dark outside because this was a saturday night i think it was around two o'clock in the morning and we are doing some experiments here you can see switches and people generating traffic and the fpga is in this guy here uh no sorry is it in this guy i think so i think the fpga is in this guy we have to trace back the, all the cables. But anyway, um, and finally, this is a picture of Mateus at SIGCOM uh, 2019. Um, we received the third prize in the undergrad uh, while he was still an undergrad um, prize. So this was Styles 19, still in person. Again, guys, um, these pictures are from 2019. So I do not have um, more updated pictures because of COVID. And I actually haven't seen Saket Mateus for <clears throat> at least two years. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much. This ends my presentation. So thank you so much. Uh, and let me check, uh, Fernanda. Let me add you to the stream. Um, <clears throat> so that's it. And I'm sorry if I passed a bit. <laughs> no, that's time. OK. Yes, it was a wonderful presentation. Yes, a very interesting work, very interesting subject and uh, brings a lot of uh, new ideas out a lot of ideas for startups and yes very interesting um we have one question so far here in the comments from bruno borges uh, do you have a tool suggestion that uh, simulates this learning journey for network uh, virtualization i understand that there, are, there may be more than one for each part that you present uh yes so <laughs> I, i'm going to answer the, this question backwards 
<clears throat> so first of all, uh, yes, there is more than one for each part. And let me give you uh, an interesting joke that we have inside our lab. Um, I am mostly on the hardware side. Waverton is mostly on the network side, so on the on the software side. And uh, we actually met when because we shared the same room in the university. So uh, we said, let's work with something. Let's do something together. We can do something. And the networking guys, they don't care about hardware. They say, yeah, I have this software. I, I don't care. Let's see if it works. And the hardware guys say, of course, it's not going to work. It's going to be too slow or something like that. Uh, so um, this partnership of this work um, works because Waverton is a excellent specialist guy on the networking side and I am on the hardware side. So uh, answering your question, um, there is more than one part. Yes, of, uh, definitely. You, you need to understand the hardware side. You need to understand the software side. And we joke around that Waverton is like the architect and Sake, Mateus and I, we are the civil engineers, like the construction engineers. So he comes and says, so I want a pyramid made out of glass, uh, which is sunny, but it stays cool inside with a basement for this and that. And then Mateus and I, we have to construct this thing. And it's always really hard. We usually spend a few months discussing on what to implement and how to implement before we actually can do something. So, uh, so yes, Bruno, um, there is more. There is a lot here. We have plenty of subjects. Um, and the the... The good thing, which is also the bad thing, is that everything is very recent. So this is some recent research. So for example, switch virtualization, as far as we know, um, PVS is the only thing in the literature that can actually uh, virtualize things without replicating. You know, like besides putting two FPGAs, one on the side of the other. I mean, sharing resources, PVS is the only thing that can actually virtualize switches. And there is still, there isn't still a control abstraction that can deal with everything. So even us, we are in the early steps of actually making a product that is fully virtualized. So, uh, so to learn that, um, I would suggest start by learning P4. This is the starting point. Um, SDNet is kind of hard, so I would ask you to, to contact Mateus, send me an email, I, I can send it to Mateus, Mateus can explain it to you briefly, and the rest, we are still to, to find out what we have to do. So, for example, how to, how to share a custom resource between two virtual switches, uh, we still don't know how to do that. So uh, I'm sorry if it's not if it's not a complete answer, the, but the answer is complicated. <laughs> <laughs> We have another question. It's from Miriam Lesser. Uh, she said that you said about having uh, the tool from P4 to high-level synthesis, yes, code. So I thought it was provided by Zynix with SDNet. How does your tool um, differ or add to Zynix provided? Yes, uh, th that is correct. Um, our whole project uh, is strongly based on the NetFPJ project and SDNet is kind of part of it. So let me just go back. Um, oh, I, I don't think I can go back. But <clears throat> anyway, uh, let me go this way for another, because I'm not going back on my slides. Uh, so uh, yes, we do use SDNet, but the thing is that SDNet is purely a compiler from PX uh, to generating a few files. We have a whole scripting stuff that 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 wraps around SDNet. So we use SDNet. We cannot do absolutely anything without SDNet in terms of AGLS. You can actually write your own drivers. You can actually write your own switch and deploy in our platform. But again, this is this is too costly. Um, so we do use SDNet. We encourage SDNet. Uh, if you actually want to write your own SDNet, you can. Uh, we did not, so we are using SDNet um, because it's fast. Uh, and so uh, how does your tool differ 
differ or add to that Zarlings provides. So uh, our tool differs, differs for the scripting around SDNet. So SDNet generates a command line interface, but we have like 10, 12, 26 command line interfaces and we have to deal with these guys. SDNet generates, uh, sees the global memory of the FPGA as a single memory. As we have multiple virtual switches, each virtual switch has its own memory space. So we have to change again the scripting and, and implement around the SDNet so that we can use the SDNet to create uh, what we have. And on top of the canonical, I mean, this is out of the scope of your question, but again, um, against NetFPJ, they can only do a single virtual switch. So we have to, again, change basically all the scripting, everything around it. We change most of it, the HDLs. I think the diff from our open source is something around two to 3,000 lines of code for the first version. So, uh, yeah, we have lots of stuff around it, but using SDNet is what makes sense here. I have one question, José Rodrigo, about the verification process, because, of course, it's probably very complicated because you have a, a standard flows, uh, companies that provide the flows. You can do your flow, and you have, uh, in one point, uh, like um, some constraints that uh, the network already uh, needs and, uh, and, and all the communication protocols and so on, and you need it to to make these modifications, you are going to do partial reconfiguration, but you all the time need to verify if everything is it's, it's okay, yes. Yeah, so this is a huge problem. Uh, initially, let, let me show back my slides here, uh, one second. So initially, this was our setup here. <laughs> so this is actually each computer is generating traffic all this traffic is going to this switch, and this switch has an optical connection to the FPGA board. So this is how we used to add up to 10 gigabits. So this is not ideal, okay? Uh, now we have these smart NICs, and these smart NICs, they generate traffic uh, as you want. So um, it, it is not that simple, but they generate traffic and they parse traffic back. So they, they measure throughput, they measure latency. Uh, you can even add your own custom packets. Let's say, for, so I'm sending this packet and this, this packet, like a list of packets. Uh, they do that. Um, it's just that sometimes it's hard to get to line rate. So generating 100 gigabit of data is not always that easy. Um, and also we have some statistics here because you cannot simply measure and say, yeah, I got 10. No, you have to do this experiment over and over again and find statistical results for this data. Um, so yeah, it's not that easy. Uh, it was much harder two years ago. <laughs> now it's kind of easier, but still not that easy. And we currently have two FPGA boards, so we can connect FPGA boards. We can even generate traffic from one FPGA to the other one. Um, so yeah, we, our setup is improving, but there are still some challenges to, to perform some, some measurements. Usually at least a week, we spend a whole week, like 12 hours a day, uh, performing experiments for, to, for writing a paper or something like that. No, that's that's nice. No, but I was expecting that. That's very nice. I don't know if you have more questions, two speakers. Oh, I can see here a hello from Estonia from yeah, Samuel. Yeah, Samuel did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Samuel helped us a lot with the ASIC implementation. He that's made a, a, a huge improvement, yes, in the throughput. Yeah, because uh, we, we were we had like virtualization, but when we compare to the Tofino, for example, these guys are doing like six terabit. So if we could have reprogrammability and multiple switches and still get terabit communication, then this would be really, really, really good. So Samuel helped us a lot there, yeah. Okay, so I'd like to thank you again, Jose Rodrigo. I think it was a wonderful talk. 
He has a lot of information and you are doing a great work. And everybody that is interested can contact you by your email, yes, and your website, as you can put in. Uh, yeah, my email is here on the presentation. So if you have any questions or any suggestions, collaborations, anything, you can just send an email. If I don't know the answer, I will just forward it to someone who knows the answer. But I, I will definitely answer you. So yeah, so thank you, Fernanda. And well, I guess I'll see you next week. Yes. <laughs> Okay, then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.